Welcome to the second part of uh, second podcast on protein ligand docking. Uh, in the first part, we gave some basic overview of what protein ligand docking is and a little bit about how one does it. In this podcast, we're going to look at a specific example of protein ligand docking. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we want to talk about here is conducting a de novo docking study. De novo meaning from scratch or from the beginning. So uh, the situation is as follows. We've identified a, a potential target receptor and uh, through QSAR studies and other uh, computational and experimental methods, we have a candidate drug. And what we want to do is to dock the receptor in the candidate drug measure some of their energies, and choose a probable uh, best active site in ligand conformation or pose. So uh, what we're going to be looking to do is we're going to have a fairly large receptor and with multiple uh, active sites. And what we're looking to do is see for a given ligand if we can find which of the active sites uh, uh, is the most probable target. Uh, the receptor we're going to use is cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2 and the ligand we're going to use is uh, Celecoxib, a um, fairly well-known drug and you see that pictured over on the right hand side here. Okay, uh, when we're doing docking studies, uh, anytime you're, you're looking at these, uh, the pharmacodynamics of, of drugs, we always want to think about or perhaps take a look at uh, the biochemical pathway. And you should see the celecoxib drug uh, here uh, sort of in the middle to the right. And you notice that it serves a number of uh, to inhibit a number of areas, the CYP2D6 enzyme, uh, PD, PDK3, a uh, variety of enzymes that it, it um, will serve to inhibit. Also, PTGS2, uh, which also are, these are uh, genes that are also inhibited by the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin and ibuprofen. You've seen this pathway before. Uh, but then again, but keep in mind that when you're doing these docking studies, you, you really want to be able to say um, where is this thing uh, going and what, if, it, if it actually does something, what will, it, what will it influence? Okay, so we're going to walk you through uh, in a fairly static mode. We'll do this in, uh, live in the demo in an Illuminate session. But we wanted you to have a uh, uh, sort of an idea of what this uh, de novo study would look like. <coughs> Obviously, we're going to skip some steps uh, to save a little time. You'll see those in the demonstration. Uh, but we start out by going up under File and coming down to Import Molecules. In this case, we have two separate molecules. We have the ligand and we have the receptor. Uh, we did not get these from, actually, we got them from P Protein Data Bank. But uh, th these uh, molecules are separate and we need to import them one at a time. So here you see we've already imported uh, the protein by going up under the file menu and saying import molecules. Okay. Uh, we've also just imported the uh, uh, celecoxib drug, the ligand, and uh, this is a large protein and the uh, software will put the ligand wherever it, it feels like and you might not even be able to see the ligand. You might have to zoom really far out to see the ligand and the protein in the same window. And in our case, we can't see um, we can't see both of them at the same time. Notice COX-2 has a, an A part and a B part. Okay, so it has a, a two parts to it. Okay. Um, what we want to do now is we typically do is we want to detect cavities and with the uh, demonstration we did in part A we, we accepted the defaults and we let it detect only five cavities here. I'm going to uh, uh, increase the number of cavities to 10 uh, to get a little better view of, of, of where the active sites might be. So uh, we change that number to 10. Okay, here I am on the left-hand side. You can, while well, you can see the the different cavities in green, 
actually embedded in the protein there and they're all over the place. You can over on the left hand side see the 10 cavities displayed and notice there the volumes are shown. Uh, we've got a lot of cavities that are pretty big. Notice that one at the top is 1180 uh, cubic meters. Excuse me. And then going down to the bottom where some of the cavities are a little bit smaller. Okay, so we'll have to figure out which one of these is the uh, one that's going to be the best site for the, the drug that we're trying to dock into there. Now here's a view of just the cavities by themselves. So you can see uh, it's a little hard to see here statically. If I rotate these around, you can see them a little better. Uh, but you should notice that some of them are pretty big. Some of them, like the one at the bottom right-hand side, are pretty small. So uh, we've got a lot of choices here in terms of uh, what the uh, software is going to be looking for. Okay, I'm going to now do you turn on the docking wizard, and I'm going to choose which ligands to dock. I'm going to uh, dock, of course, the ligand with the protein. I'm not going to use a reference ligand in here because uh, unlike the first demo that I had, in the first demo, I already had a ligand pretty much in the right place. And what I was looking to do in the first demo is to uh, uh, let the software compare conformational changes to the ligand and match it up with the one that already existed. But here I'm shooting blind. I'm going to basically just be looking in all of the active sites for a good place to put a ligand. And so there's no reference ligand in this case. Okay, so uh, when I go to my next window, which is my binding site, you see the green binding sphere there. That's what it starts out with. It has a radius of about 15, uh, 15 angstroms or so. By the way, under origin, under binding site, make sure it says user defined. Okay, and clearly this binding site is nowhere near big enough to encapsulate all of the active site possibilities that I have uh, as shown in the with the green there. So going to the next window, I've increased my radius from 15 to something like 39 or 40. It's a pretty big uh, binding site. That's, uh, that's a lot of space to search. And again, when you do this, you can rotate the sphere around, make sure all the cavities are encapsulated within the sphere. Uh, but you'll notice in a minute here where a radius of 39 angstroms is a big binding site. And that's going to reflect itself when we get to the actually run the run the job. Okay, under search algorithm, uh, again, you really want to do at a minimum for an effective search. You really want to do at least uh, 10 runs. The literature says somewhere between 10 and 15 runs. If you're you've um, done the runs a couple times and you're starting to get a pretty good idea of what things look like, you might want to increase the number of runs or Conversely, if you think you know where you're specifically where you're looking um, and you want to hone in, you could certainly decrease the number of runs and that would save you some, some compute time. But uh, 10 to 15 is a pretty good uh, number for starting uh, out to do an initial run. Uh, the software by default gives you 10 as the number of runs. And in this case, we're going to leave that alone and see how that does. Um, the Pose clustering, uh, usually we want to have multiple poses for each run. The maximum number of poses, it typically finds the five best poses. Uh, we wanted a little bit uh, more than that. We wanted the 10 best poses. So we bumped that number up to 10 a little bit. Okay, in this particular case, we get a warning. We have the wrong number of atoms in a protein residue. So one of the residues uh, in this structure, and I forget the exact count on uh, how many residues or how many amino acids, residue and amino acid, remember, mean the same thing. Um, there's an awful lot of, of amino acids in this protein, and so I'm not going to be too worried that uh, in one of these protein residues, one of these amino acids, I got the wrong number of atoms. It's a warning. It's not an error message. If it was an error, it wouldn't let you run uh, the calculation until you fix the error. In this case, it's just a warning. So I'm going to go ahead and let it uh, let it run even though there is a warning and hope, uh, assume that there's not going to be too bad of an error because of that. Okay, um, you really should save your workspace uh, occasionally when you get a number of things done. If you go down and save your workspace as and what you really should do is put it somewhere. Um, it will save it in the Malegro examples folder by default. But you really should go out on your desktop, uh, create a new folder. I call this one uh, 
um, celecoxib demo example and I made a folder for that and I stuck it on my desktop and I'm going to save all of these files to that uh, to that folder on my desktop so I have a record of, of this particular run. So you have to pay attention as you always should to where files are going. You should save files. Uh, if you want to go back and look at them again, uh, you can't do that, of course, unless you save them. Okay, so uh, once again, I set the number of poses at 10, just to remind you that we've done that. Okay, and now we're, we've started our run. Now, notice the finish time. I started this run um, uh, about 1 o'clock on, on, on Sunday, May 3rd in the afternoon. And notice it says it will finish somewhere around August 6th. Uh, so that's about a 95-day run. Now, the good news is, of course, I show you this. Uh, and that clock, uh, after you let it go for a while, spins down pretty quickly from 95 to 55 days to 28 days on and on. It spins down pretty quickly. And I think this run took about an hour, an hour and a half or so, uh, all told. So, but it's... I wanted to show you this slide so you don't get sort of freaked out when you see the finish time being, I did one the other day that was 188 days when it first told me how long it was going to take to run. So uh, when you see that, uh, keep an eye on it, but don't let it freak you out. Okay, and now the run has been completed. It actually, this actually was a, about a 43 minute run, uh, not too bad. So. Uh, and you want to keep an eye on where it says it is safe to close this window now. And of course, you can click on the close button in the bottom right hand corner. Okay, what I want to do now is go back up to file and I want to import my docking results from a star.mvd results file. And again, hopefully, you've saved that in a, um, in a good place uh, so you can find it. If not, it's going to be under. Uh, MVD examples in the uh, program directory, so you should be able to find it there. Okay, when I import the results, it comes uh, up on the screen via a pose organizer, so I can see the pose data here. And notice that I have um, I have ten different runs for this one. The best score looks like a minus 154 kilojoules per mole or so. Um, but I got runs from one, from zero, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, is there a six in there? Yeah, there's a six in there. Seven, eight, and nine. So I've got ten runs there. Okay, and a good thing to do. I'm not sure I have a slide showing it, but uh, you should. Uh, you can decide if you want to include all ten. I think it's a good idea when you're first getting started to. Uh, check all of the poses that the software gives you. So I would click on all 10 of these, import them into your workspace, and then you can look at them, experiment them. As you get a little bit more experience, uh, maybe you only would want to import, say, the top five of these, or the top two, or the top three, whatever the case may be. But I think at the beginning, you really should organize all, all uh, you know, import all of them, all the ones that the software gives you into your workspace. It, once you click on all 10, you can click on the Open Checked Poses and Data Analyzer, and that will give you a new window. It sort of looks like a spreadsheet, and we'll uh, spend some time talking about uh, that data um, in another session on how what you do with that data. Okay. Once you check on all those and you've gotten all that, you can click on the OK button, and what you should see now, the step following that, is I have my 10 poses in there. Uh, notice I have the active space, uh, or excuse me, the proteins are turned off, the active ligand is turned off, and all I'm seeing is the poses in the cavity. Now, what you should notice here is there are a number of cavities that don't have any poses uh, bound to them. So what I'm going to do systematically, it's hard to, I'll demo this when we do this live, but I'm going to one by one uh, turn cavities on and off. If they don't have something in them, okay, I'm going to remove them from the pose. You do that by uh, holding down the control key and doing a control click and then it will say remove cavity from the workspace. So as I find cavities that don't have or active sites that don't have anything in them, I'm going to go ahead and remove them from the workspace so they don't uh, clutter up the, the workspace. And likewise, if there are poses that I think are 
not exactly, they don't match up well with the cavity or an active site. They're, uh, they look, there's just something about them that doesn't look, look right, and that comes with a little bit of experience. Again, I'm going to go ahead and also eliminate them from my workspace. And I think in this next slide here, I show that I've eliminated nine of the 10 cavities and I've eliminated uh, seven of the 10 um, poses. And I've really honed in on this is through an uh, iterative process. You know, it took me about, about 15, 20 minutes to go through all of the cavities, go through all the poses one by one, look at all the combinations, try to figure out which one I thought was the the, the most probable target uh, uh, pose and which was the best cavity to fit that. And I chose that pose number four. That's the one that's clicked and cavity with a volume of 58.88 are the most likely candidates that I would want to pursue a little bit further. And you see them highlighted here. Okay. What I then did, I looked at, since I had a couple poses, I had three poses in the past slide, but pose number four really looked like the one that I thought was going to be the best fit. And so by control clicking on uh, that pose, I said convert pose to the active ligand. So now, as far as the software concerned, uh, pose number four is considered to be the active ligand. And anytime I ask the software to do something with the active ligand, it will actually uh, uh, do its calculations on pose number four. So you see there where I only have two poses left under my pose uh, organizer because one of those has been converted to an active to the active ligand. Okay. And the last step is I by using uh, showing my hydrogen bonds and by going up under tools and turning labels on. We'll do this in the demos. Um, I sort of have a, a final result, so I show a sort of a zoomed in picture of my active ligand, which was one of my poses, and I show uh, some of the nearby amino acids from the cyclooxygenase 2 protein and their labels. So now I have a pretty good idea uh, that leucine, uh, uh, amino acid number 531, is something that might be of interest. I got a tyrosine in there. Uh, I've got a couple of those in. I got a glycine in there. Uh, I got a methionine in there. So I'm looking at the residues or the amino acids uh, from the protein receptor that are closest to the ligand. And further studies will allow me to really hone in on what those energies are uh, among between those various amino acids and the ligand. And we'll do a little bit of that in the demo. So that's it for this podcast. Uh, we'll do a live demo of this on Thursday night. And we'll see you then.